welcome to the AI and Big Data uh, in Finance webinar. Uh, we are delighted to have uh, two distinguished speakers today. We have Nikhil Agarwal from MIT, and he will present a paper combining human expertise with uh, artificial intelligence, experimental evidence from radiology. Zayed uh, Obermeyer from uh, UC Berkeley will be the discussant. Nikhil will have 30 minutes for the presentation. Uh, if there are any clarifying questions, please raise your hand and I might interrupt the presentation about 15 minutes in. Uh, Zayed will have 20 minutes for his discussion. Afterwards, we'll open the, uh, the floor for questioning from the audience. Uh, if you are in the audience, please submit your questions in the Q&A. Uh, I will then call on you during the questioning part. As a reminder, please be respectful uh, with your comments. We do record the presentation and we do post the video and the slides on the website. After the main part of the webinar, we'll have an unrecorded discussion with everyone in the audience uh, uh, being upgraded to a panelist. Uh, Nikhil, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, and thanks in particular to uh, Ziad Obermeyer for uh, taking the time to uh, discuss this paper. I'm very, very much looking forward to uh, all the comments here today because we're in the middle of uh, free writing this paper. So this uh, this is work with uh, this joint work with my colleague Tobias Sals, uh, a grad student Alex Morning, and uh, Pranav Rajpurkar, who's a, a computer scientist at Harvard Medical School. And here we're thinking about how uh, we should combine human expertise with AI. Um, and we're going to be running an experiment with professional radiologists to try and answer that question. Um, so uh, there isn't a lot of need to uh, motivate uh, artificial intelligence as an important topic. It's uh, uh, you know there's lots of concerns about how it's going to transform the economy and transform work, and it's because it's a general purpose technology and also relative to uh, previous technological revolutions, AI seems to target relatively higher skill uh, occupations, whether it's complements or substitutes is potentially an open open question. And within this space, given the uh, advances in computer vision, radiology is an iconic example. And one way to characterize uh, the role radiology plays in, in this domain is a quote by Jeffrey Hinton in 2016. Um, that's, and Je Jeffrey Hinton is one of the founding fathers of AI. Uh, he said that we should stop training radiologists now it's uh, completely obvious that within five years, deep learning is going to do better than radiologists. Uh, in all fairness, Jeffrey Hinton has retracted that quote uh, since then, but uh, it's too good not to use it uh, uh, for the stock. Uh, and you know, Ziad Obermeyer and uh, Emmanuel have also uh, written an article in 2016, uh, thinking carefully about the potential role that AI is gonna play in radiology uh, prospectively. And so once, if you're, as an economist, if I want to think about, uh, you know, humans versus AI tools, uh, you know, and we're going to talk about machine learning tools, and I'll use AI and machine learning interchangeably. We want to think about the comparative advantages that humans and AI tools have. Uh, so one, uh, one thing that humans often have, and, you know, in finance, you think about like soft information, hard information, uh, I'm going to call it contextual information. So humans often have access to information that is potentially non systematically recorded, that, that cannot be recorded systematically or is not available for the training of AI algorithms. And so that information can be valuable, but humans may not be good at potentially combining this information with a prediction that's based on systematic data because we may not, uh, you know, Bayesian update, for example, with correct beliefs and so on. Uh, a third difference is that uh, AI tools, while they're expensive to train once uh, for a while, uh, and so are radiologists, uh, the cost of deploying AI once it has been uh, developed is uh, very low. The marginal cost is very low. But radiologists are highly skilled, they are highly paid, and the marginal cost of time uh, is can be high uh, on an ongoing basis for a long time. So uh, what are we going to do uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this experiment? Well, first we're going to try to ask whether contextual information and AI assistance is valuable. And to do that, we're going to conduct an information experiment with radiologists who are going to be diagnosing patient cases with uh, the use of a chest, x-ray, and other types of clinical information. The other types of clinical information uh, is not uh, going to be used by the AI tool that is uh, going to provide predictions to the radiologists. And uh, I'll get into this a bit more, and that's got to do with uh, HIPAA regulations that make it a little bit hard to use 
uh, uh, sometimes used uh, uh, chart data. Uh, uh, second, we're going to ask: uh, Do humans and a uh, humans combine AI predictions with their own information uh, correctly? Uh, not surprisingly, they're going to be deviating from the benchmark model of Bayesian updating with correct beliefs about the distribution of signals that the AI has in their own information. Uh, but we're going to try to unpack uh, the box on how their what their biases and belief updating look like. There'll be more details in the paper. I'll give you a quick flavor of it in the interest of time. Uh, and third, uh, in light of the fact that humans are not going to be combining this information, uh, their own information and AI uh, uh, predictions uh, appropriately, how should we design human AI collaboration? Specifically, we're going to solve for an optimal delegation policy as a function of the AI prediction, whereby a case could either go to the AI fully automated, uh, a human unassisted, or a human with the assistance of um, an AI tool. All right. So. Uh, I'm going to first describe what the experiment looks like. Uh, I'll get into some of the details of the design, uh, but give you a flavor on some of the nuances that I'll refer you to the paper for for further detail. And then we'll think about the treatment effects. We'll tell you uh, 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 something about the performance of humans uh, under the various uh, information environments, uh, discussion of uh, what types of bias belief updating uh, we find, and then the optimal delegation problem. Okay, so let's go through the experimental design. Uh, so, for the purposes of this talk, uh, we uh, we had we recruited radiologists. We had hired radiologists uh, from teleradiology company uh, from teleradiology companies, and these radiologists participated remotely through a tailor-made interface for this experiment. Uh, in this in this interface mimics clinical practice um, as as closely as possible, and I'll say a little bit more detail on that. Uh, so we present the uh, X-ray, we present the clinical information, et cetera, and we give them tools to modify uh, modify the X-rays, contrast, brightness, zoom, et cetera. Uh, but one key difference is going to be that instead of getting a free text report, which uh, radiologists typically would write down, we're going to get uh, structured data entry from radiologists. And this whole experiment setup uh, interface was designed with uh, radiologists at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York and Stanford Medical School. Um, and so the screen at the bottom, the second half of the screen at the bottom shows you uh, what that uh, data entry uh, process looks like. So airspace opacity is a class of uh, chest pathologies. Pneumonia is an example of an airspace opacity. So if there's a, if there's a shadow, uh, uh, so to speak, in the airspace area, uh, that's the kind of class of diseases that this is uh, uh, eliciting. Um, uh, the radiologist assessments of. And so we ask for the radiologist for how likely it is uh, that an airspace opacity is present uh, using the slider. And we, you know, analyze the data using the probability report precisely as well as taking the reports as ordinal, that larger numbers to the right are more than smaller numbers. And then the other thing that we can look up is look for is a recommended follow up, whether uh, the radiologist recommends that this patient should be follow up, uh, followed up for this pathology or not, yes or no. When the AI prediction is going to be made available, there'll be this AI prediction, which has 12% in this case, very unlikely. Okay, so uh, what is the AI prediction that we uh, provide? We uh, use a, a algorithm that was uh, developed at, at Stanford uh, that was based on a uh, that was based on a competition uh, in which 250 more than 250,000 chest X-rays were released with. Uh, labeled data, labeled for one of 14 pathologies, and the uh, and various uh, academic groups as well as uh, companies uh, using just the X-ray, just the image, uh, predicted which pathologies are present. Uh, and then there was a leaderboard that uh, that you know shows which are the best uh, best uh, algorithms. And then Stanford uh, Stanford team took some of the ideas from these best algorithms and combined it into their own uh, algorithm that is one of the top 10 algorithms. Uh, on the leaderboard for the uh, for the competition, and in prior studies uh, by the by this team, they have shown that this uh, algorithm does as well as uh, two thirds or better than about two thirds of uh, board certified Stanford radiologists. Right, so this algorithm is supposed to kind of predict what usually Stanford radiologists think about these various cases, and so we're going to provide in the AI treatment access to check first probability for the presence of one of these fourteen pathologies, including airspace opacity. 
The second treatment dimension is uh, clinical history. This is information that is available at the time that the case was being read uh, by the case was ordered for the uh, uh, for for the radiological assessment. Um, here's an example: thirty years of age, female, high, history of hypertension, abnormal EKG, abnormal pain. Evaluate for cardiomegaly or mediastinal widening. So that's a note by the treating physician uh, indicating. Uh, what what you know they might suspect the case might be and relevant what they think of as relevant uh, uh, features for the case. In addition, vitals are presented. Uh, all labs that were uh, available to the radiologist at the time that the X-ray was ordered are uh, presented with the abnormal labs uh, flagged, uh, but they can click on all of the labs. Uh, now, so this in, this information is not uh, used by the uh, algorithm to make predictions, and part of the reason is that getting this kind of structured data and text data out of uh, an ho a hospital can be uh, can be costly because of HIPAA regulations, and then uh, that can create some barriers to training algorithms. And I know that Ziad has been working on on uh, circumventing some of those barriers uh, so that uh, we can do this. So uh, this is great for our uh, Purposes uh, for thinking about this as contextual information. In other contexts, uh, it might be difficult to quantify or show toggle contextual information. Think about your interaction with a doctor. Uh, they might see your disposition and learn a lot about, uh, and, and that's useful information for what might be wrong with you. Uh, but you know, toggling that in an experiment might be difficult. So conceptually, we hope that this is getting close to uh, that. In addition to, I think, being relevant for. Uh, the state of radiology at least today, and a state of AI tools in radiology at least today. Okay, uh, so uh, the so we need something to compare the quality of an assessment uh, against, and so we're going to develop, uh, uh, you know, we're going to follow the AI literature and uh, come up with a diagnostic standard. Uh, so you know, if you think about cardiomegaly, it's a disease which means that the heart is larger than it should be, and you know, you can only figure that out either using some kind of imaging technique. Or uh, an autopsy. Now it's, it's because you can then potentially measure the, the heart. But getting unselected labels on whether a patient has cardiomegaly or not is difficult. And so what we're going to do is we're going to construct what what we'll call a diagnostic standard, which will be an aggregate assessment of experts. So we're going to take five board certified radiologists from Mount Sinai Hospital that specialize in chest radiology and have at least ten years of experience to tell us what the what their, what their assessments for the case are, and we're gonna aggregate that. We also have versions in the paper in which we've taken our experimental subjects, over 200 of them, and had a leave, have a leave one out version of this diagnostic standard. So the way to think about this, the treatment effects that you'll see is, are the hum, are the experts closer to this diagnostic standard? So you know, if usually a case is only read by one radiologist, if we had the aggregate assessments of multiple, we, you, know, you might think that you'll get closer to a, a better diagnosis. Okay, and so you know the selective labels problem is an important issue that uh, uh, in this literature, and and so uh, you know in general, if there was a follow up test, it's selected on an on a on an assessment that from initial test that this case might be suspicious. So we want to get unselected uh, diagnostic standards for each case, and this is how we're going to do this. Okay, um, and so uh, let me uh, move ahead. And okay, yeah, so the experimental design, sorry, uh, there's something glitchy, slightly glitchy about my PDF here. Okay, so the experimental design uh, is going to be as follows. So, what we want to do are two things. First, we want to uh, measure the, the treatment effects of providing these different types of information to the radiologist. But second, we want to construct a Bayesian benchmark. Uh, so, what did the radiologist think without AI? What do they think with AI? And uh, compare what they think thought with AI. Uh, to a Bayesian benchmark, which we'll construct by looking at their assessments without AI and knowing what the AI said. Okay. Second, uh, so that's going to ideally have linked assessments for the same case with and without AI, which will create some potential issues about anchoring as well as uh, order effects. And we, you know, we're quite careful in the experimental design. Uh, we'll have some kind of washout period, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. A second issue is going to be power. So we we hired these radiologists uh, on the open market and paid them about ten dollars a case. So it's an expensive subject pool, and so we have approximately this experiment. We spent about two hundred fifty thousand dollars, so it's twenty five thousand uh, reads. Uh, but nonetheless, to get to maximize power, 
what you want to do is to collect data that's both within and across subject. I, you know, if, if budget wasn't a constraint, uh, what you might want to do is to just have radiologists that are exposed to different treatments and then maybe uh, the cross treatment, cross radiology heterogeneity would wash out, but that would require a lot of data according to our, our pilots. Uh, by using a within design in which radiologists, each radiologist is exposed to all treatments and they read between 15 and 60 cases in each, uh, each treatment, uh, you can maximize power because each, the treatments are, uh, are, uh, are balanced across radiologists, but you also have an across design to make sure that based on the first treatment uh, to compare with the within design to make sure that uh, you know there aren't any order effects that are that are substantial. So we passed that test at least. Um, so for the AI case, for figuring out the patient benchmark, we have a subset of radiologists who read the same case both and without uh, with and without AI. Okay, that allows to get uh, the patient benchmark. But you'd worry that they'd remember information. Let's say I showed you AI first, then they might remember if they encounter the case again. Or if I showed you the case without AI first and AI later, then maybe there's an order effect. And so what we're going to do is we're going to show the radiologist the same case twice, but with at least a two-week washout period. So the idea is that they don't remember information that was provided to them more than two weeks ago. And that will allow us to have AI first or AI second. And so that, that, that helps a lot. And there's some tests in the paper to see whether they remember the AI assessment uh, previously or not. So it's a hybrid design that combines all of these features. Okay, so now let's get into the treatment effects. Uh, sorry, I, I missed the slide. There's something somewhat glitchy going on. Okay, so first let's look at the performance of the AI tool relative to the radiologist. Here's a histogram uh, in which you have the root mean square error on the left-hand side or the AUROC, which is another measure of performance. Smaller values of root mean square error are better and higher values of AUROC are higher. Here's a histogram of radiologist performance from our experiment. So there are about 200 plus radiologists in our experiment. Uh, and the AI is in the 32nd percentile for root mean square error or the 67th percentile for AUROC. So no matter which metric you look at, the AI is better than about two thirds of radiologists in our experiment. And these are all professional radiologists in our experiment. Okay, so a lot of radiologists would do better just by following the AI. Okay, so that's one takeaway from this slide. So now, in light of that, let's look at the treatment effects. Here's the treatment effect of uh, uh, of uh, the AI or the clinical history or an interaction between the two, with standard as clustered at the uh, radiologist and the two-way cluster at the radiologist and the case pathology level. Uh, and the vertical axis is the deviation from the diagnostic standard. So negative numbers means better performance because you don't want to have a high absolute deviation between your reported probability and the diagnostic standard. Uh, the treatment effect of providing AI is zero. Uh, so AI does not improve performance, even though two thirds of radiologists would do better just by following the AI. The treatment of effect of providing clinical history is negative, which means humans do better when clinical history is provided. And uh, so therefore clinical history is potentially valuable, okay? The interaction is zero, which means there are no complementarity or substitutes in that, in that dimension. Okay, so what's going on? Are the radiologists not ign completely ignoring the AI assessment? Is that why the effect of AI is zero? Well, it doesn't happen to be the case. If you look at the treatment effect of the deviation from the AI's prediction, when AI is provided, uh, humans, the deviation from the AI prediction decreases. So the radiologists are moving closer to the AI prediction, but they're not doing better on average. When clinical history is provided, which you should think of as a placebo, there's no effect of uh, the deviation from the AI uh, prediction. So what is it, why is it that humans are moving closer to the AI, but not doing better on average? Well, it turns out that if I look at the conditional average treatment effect of AI, so I've got, again got the deviation from the diagnostic standard on the vertical axis, but now I'm giving you the treatment effect conditional on bins of AI prediction. Uh, 0 to 20%, 20 to 40%, and so on. Uh, if the AI is quite confident that, a case, by the way, the average AI prediction is about 23%, because most of the cases are negative, so the, uh, so, uh, you know, most of the data is in the first two or three bins. Okay, so if the AI is con more confident than average that the case is negative, it turns out that 
providing AI assistance uh, makes radiologists, uh, you know, closer to the, to the diagnostic standard. So they're better at potentially clearing cases if AI is confident that the case is negative. Okay, if the case is extremely, if the AI is very confident the case is positive, which does not happen that often. Uh, there are some weak effects that are the standard errors are large. Okay. If the AI is between 0.2 and 0.6, so it says, okay, the case could be positive, but it's not super confident that the case is positive, providing AI assistance actually leads to worse decisions, worse assessments. Okay. So this on its own uh, conflicts with the idea that humans are uh, Bayesians with correct beliefs about the uh, distribution of the AI prediction and their own assessments. Now, you know, we did a lot of work on training these radiologists. They understand that uh, uh, how the AI was trained. We have comprehension questions about how the probabilities in the AI should be uh, perceived. We show them example cases. And so there's a lot of uh, effort that we exerted pre-experiment to make sure that to the best of our ability to make sure that they understand it, uh, maybe more training would be useful, but they seem to get misled by these uh, predictions between 0.2 and 0.6. Okay, you can already start seeing now why you might want to delegate selectively or provide AI assistance selectively, given given what this graph is showing you. The other thing I'll note is that this is on assessments on the probabilities. Uh, you can do this with uh, incorrect treatment follow up, and you get somewhat similar results as well. That uh, middling AI predictions result in worse uh, uh, treatment recommendations. Okay, so now given this, uh, you know you might think about what kinds of biases and belief updating might be responsible for this. And so there's a whole part of the paper that tries to think about the behavioral economics of how uh, prediction, uh, predictions by AI are incorporated into human beliefs. Um, and we described this using a model by Grether, building on a framework by Grether, in which uh, the posterior odds of, uh, uh, which are the decision relevant odds uh, that, a, that a human has with AI assistance, which is on the left uh, given in P is a uh, function of the prior uh, that a uh, prior odds with just the expert information. So X, SE is the expert's signal about the case. Omega, if it's positive, is one, and omega, if it's negative, is zero. And so this tells you what are the log odds of the case being positive given just the expert decision. And then if the uh, if the human has access to the AI information, which is SA, then uh, this should be the update to their prior beliefs. If you are Bayesian with correct beliefs, B would be equal to D, uh, and they would both be equal to one. And so we're gonna allow for humans to misweight these two terms. And in particular, we're gonna call humans as being automation neglectful if B is less than D. So they underweight the AI signal. Now, a second type of mistake that we will admit is that uh, when updating the AI, updating with the AI assessment, the humans don't condition on SE. So what does that mean? Well, the humans can see the image, the AI can see the image. So there's some correlation and some redundancy in that information, okay? Now, if humans are not correctly accounting for it, they might update potentially too much by uh, well, potentially too much because if they see the image and the AI see the image, then the update should not be that large if they think about the image in the same way, okay? So if I, one potential bias, which has been do documented in the lab called correlation neglect, is that uh, they don't condition on SE. And so uh, this is a more general version of it. And so we're gonna try to, we'll select between models of, uh, uh, you know, whether there's signal dependence neglect or not. So a big part of the paper unpacks this model and thinks about it. So there's a theoretical component that shows that AI assistance un unambiguously imp uh, improves performance if only automation neglect is at play. So if all, all the humans are doing is neglecting automation, uh, the AI signal, but they're moving in that right direction towards AI, then it must be the case that uh, humans are weakly better off for any signal realization. So that's obviously not what's happening in our experiment because humans were worse off making, they were making somewhat worse decisions if, uh, if the signal was between 0.2 and 0.6. So, uh, in all other cases, the delegation problem is non-trivial and depends on the signal distribution. Okay, and so uh, we find that there is some signal dependence neglect. Uh, we do that by, uh, you know, developing a suite of empirical methods that allows us to take this type of data um, and uh, and develop a uh, an approach to estimate the models that I just outlined. Okay, so there are some 
issues regarding uh, you know, how to select for identification bias. So there's some issues about measurement error because if the case is being seen twice, the it's you know it's reasonable to assume that the radiologist wouldn't have given the same assessment even without uh, without new information. So that creates some measurement error, correcting for that, uh, and then uh, doing some model selection. So what we find is that automation neglect and signal dependence uh, neglect are important. D is equal to one, so there's no evidence of what's known as base rate neglect or own information bias. Okay, and the third thing is that the selected model replicates the treatment effects that uh, I showed you earlier. Uh, and then finally, once we've estimated this joint signal distribution, uh, we can also compare uh, what a Bayesian with the correct weighting between B and D would achieve in that treatment effect graph, and a Bayesian would do much better. Bayesian with correct beliefs would do much better uh, uh, than the graphs that we saw. So there is some potential gain from human AI collaboration, but it's undercut by these biases. So one potential uh, implication of this work is that if there's a way to train uh, radiologists better uh, to like deal with these biases, or maybe they learn over time with lots of experience, uh, some of these uh, issues might become uh, a little bit less important. Okay, so now let's uh, move to the optimal delegation problem. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna think about a delegation problem in which uh, as a function of the AI's assessment, SAI, uh, a case will be assigned uh, either to full automation, to no AI, uh, but the human reads it, or to AI-assisted humans, okay? And what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to minimize a loss function that looks like this. Uh, the first one is a decision loss. Uh, you can take the uh, you can take the mistakes that are made and uh, think about the uh, ex ante decision loss by looking at the costs of false positives and false negatives, and we recover these relative costs of false positives and false negatives using the revealed preference of when radiologists decide or recommend a treatment to follow up as a function of their their probability. Uh, multiply that by m. So think about this as being in units of uh, missed cases of airspace opacity. Okay, or missed case of pneumonia, if you want to uh, uh, articulate it in terms of a particular disease. That can be multiplied by M, which is the social cost of uh, misdiagnosis in terms of false negatives. Uh, and then to that, we'll add the effort cost of humans in dollars. Uh, we measure the time that humans take under various uh, uh, treatments. And so it, they take a little bit longer with AI on average, and it also depends on the signal that the AI provides with, because Cases in which the AI is unsure is also tougher for humans. Uh, and then multiplied by W, which is the wage rate. And so our radiologists take about two and a half minutes per case. So their wage rate is about $4 a minute or $240 an hour, okay? And so we're gonna, we can compute, we don't know M, so we can com compute a frontier for different values of M between C, uh, C and V, okay? So we're gonna solve this delegation problem uh, using a classification tree to avoid uh, overfitting, okay? Uh, and here's what the delegation solution looks like in terms of whether humans are going to replace, sorry, whether AI is going to replace humans or not uh, in the process of the, in this delegation process. On the left hand side, I've got Bayesian humans, Bayesians who have the correct beliefs about the joint distribution of their own information and the AI signal. Um, on the on the horizontal axis, I've got the social cost of false negatives in dollars, which is the parameter M. Uh, and on the vertical axis, I've got a share of cases that are delegated to the various uh, approaches. So the white area is AI. So when the social cost of false negatives is really small, $10, all of the cases are uh, given to the AI. Well, I don't want to spend any effort on, I don't want to spend any time compensating radiologists once I already have an AI tool, so why not just give it everything to the AI, okay? Because I don't care about whether cases are uh, done properly or not. As the social cost of false negatives increases, uh, humans come into the picture, and this collaboration between Bayesian human and AI, I'd say social cost of uh, false negatives is between 100 and uh, 1,000 or $10,000. But even then, only about half of the cases are provided to the Bayesian human. Uh, the remaining half are given to the AI because the AI already knows, and you know, uh, it doesn't really make that much of a, it's very rare that it's pivotal, that the human has a signal that's very different. And so unless the social cost of false negatives is extremely large, uh, humans are not in the picture. There are very few cases, if at all, uh, basically ties, uh, in which the humans are asked to 
diagnose the cases without AI assistance. This should be expected because Bayesian humans do really well. Okay, they're, they're going to do they're going to incorporate the AI signal correctly. Uh, now, what about humans that are fallible and make mistakes? Uh, well, the picture looks a little bit different. For very large, relatively large cost of false negatives, uh, you start seeing humans in the loop, but humans rarely, if ever, uh, collaborate with the AI tool. So it's either the AI or the human without AI assistance that the case is delegated to. And this was previewed in the treatment effects graphs. Uh, you know, humans are worse when the AI signal is uncertain. And so providing uncertain AI signals are is not great. But if the AI is certain already, it makes a lot of sense to just uh, automate the case. So uh, what this suggests is that uh, humans are more likely to work alongside AI than with AI if performance is on the only consideration here, potentially because of the, uh, the biases that they have. Of course, if you're able to train people to understand correlations and deal with them properly, then uh, the picture might look a little different. Okay, I'm gonna uh, be ending more or less on time. So the paper studied uh, human AI integration in radiology. We found, we found that there are important forms of biases. Uh, there's automation neglect and subjects don't, uh, subjects tend to treat the AI information as independent. And if you think about it, teaching them about correlations can be a little bit difficult. Uh, AI also increases the time spent. And so therefore AI assisted humans are rarely optimal. So one of the ways in which this paper uh, contributes to uh, thinking about AI is that we've thought about behavioral biases and how they uh, affect the deployment of AI. Uh, that's one of the things that economists have uh, some comparative advantage in uh, rather than potentially developing AI tools. But another potential comparative advantage is organizational incentives, uh, whereby the, uh, you know, whether uh, when a radiologist moves, uh, uh, deviates from the AI's uh, uh, recommendation or something else, the contractual and organizational incentives uh, and malpractice incentives could also influence how they interact. And that's another area which I think is uh, potentially valuable for uh, study. Uh, thanks very much. I'm uh, uh, you know, curious for uh, all your feedback. If you didn't have a chance uh, to ask a question uh, now or during the Q&A session, please feel free to email me. Uh, and uh, I'll stop here and look forward to uh, Ziad's comments. Okay, well, thank you so much, Nikhil, for a very uh, interesting talk. Uh, Ziad will now discuss uh, the paper. Uh, thank you so much. And I think uh, maybe a great place for me to start is my view on, I think, the last question, um, Nikhil, that you asked, which is like the contribution of economics to this area. And I think the, the contribution is potentially huge for all the reasons you mentioned, but for another one that I'm actually going to bring up, which is that um, one of the things that, at least for me, as a as a non economist who works with a lot of economists, that I find so compelling about economics in this area is the kind of applied micro toolkit for thinking about the data that goes into AI. And I think a lot of my comments are on that theme. Um, so let me um, start by saying, like, I mean. As you all saw, this is a great paper, and I think I won't spend a lot of time t telling you about all the great things about it. But let me say first that I think the the thing I like most about it is that this is an area where people have a lot of opinions about how humans and AI are going to work together or not work together, and how I put up the some people think doctors will be good patients, just kind of as, as a tote. I don't think anyone actually believes that, but it's a possible belief. There, there's just so many opinions and so little evidence that I think having this paper just in that gap is fantastic. And I think it's, you know, as as you mentioned, Nikhil, it's such a clean design um, be, because, you know, for these radiologists identifying problems on chest x-ray, I mean, and it was really expensive to do. Like, I think I hadn't quite done the math in my head, but that's quite a quite a lot of money to write this paper. Uh, and I think it it shows because you've got all of these different treatments um, and you've got crossover within radiologists over time, which I think is, is fantastic. And that lets the authors develop a number of really interesting facts. You know, for example, the two first facts that are, that are you know, uh, striking is AI is better on average and humans do update towards AI. But despite those two facts, the third fact is that quality doesn't improve, even, even in light of those two facts, because of this heterogeneity because of the differential impact um, of AI as a function of the certainty of the AI. 
And then there's all of this kind of really interesting behavioral um, modeling afterwards that identifies this, um, this problem that the experts are not conditioning on you know, the, the shared information set or on their own interpretation of the signal when they're updating. So lots of great things. What I wanna do is actually just unpack, I think for me, a pretty fundamental aspect of understanding that human AI complementarity by actually just like going deep into what those components are and how they're complementary. So let me start with like what the human is doing and what the human is doing. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a radiologist at work, but basically radiologists sit in these dark rooms for like eight to 10 hours at a time and images just flash in front of them. And they're like speaking into a microphone that's recorded. So, so basically image in and human outputs this H of X. So like she's doing something with that image and translating into uh, you know some set of labels, uh, which is what uh, the cool kids call um, variable, or like the, the, the Y variables now in computer science. So, so that's what the human is doing. And I want to point out one thing that's interesting about this, which is that if you look at the machine learning playbook for vision, you know, in ImageNet is one example. There are many such examples. It's basically like radiologists. They're, they're, they're flashing images in front of mTurkers and the mTurkers are like labeling the images just like radiologists are doing. So, so that's like one parallel. And, and the radiologists are like the original um, mTurkers. They were doing this before it was cool. So, so that's what the human is doing. Now, what's the AI doing? I think this is where it gets kind of interesting, which is that, you know, there's this level of abstraction that I think is not helpful for, for understanding what the AI is doing, which is like, oh, the AI is reading the x-ray, but the AI, <laughs> AI doesn't know how to read. So what, what is it learning? And, and, and how does it learn to translate x into y hat? Well, interestingly, it actually learns from humans. So th this is kind of, I think, really one of the already one of the classic machine learning papers. This is the algorithm that I think is, is the one that's used directly in, in this paper. And this basically just follows that ImageNet playbook, which is that you get a bunch of humans to label a bunch of images, and then you um, and then you automate that labeling process. So basically, the algorithm in this case is predicting what a human would say about the image. And so basically, like the model is trained on radiologist labels. So it's kind of M of H of X, which is kind of an interesting fact to, to keep in mind. And then I think the last component here is like, well, how do you evaluate these you know, predictions, whether it's the human or the AI or the, the combination of those two things? How do, you, how do you know if this is like an error or like whether we have good diagnostic quality or not? And I think, you know, as Nikhil alluded to, like the, the way you'd want to do this in a perfect world is, well, you'd want to just get like definitive testing on people. So, you know, these people had an x-ray, let's get like a CT scan and, and an MRI, and then let's follow them up over like a five-year period and see what, like, that would be the, in, in a perfect world, what happens. But of course, we don't have that for everyone. And so this is a place where I think uh, where economics also has a lot to add to the computer science literature, which is that, you know, all of the problems that we know about from doing good causal inference about treatment effects, cousins of those problems show up in machine learning. And they're a huge problem for machine learning that I think is under acknowledged by the field. And the problem, to, to put it into you know, your language, is that doctors are selecting patients into labeling. So doctors choose whom to test. They're not testing randomly or conditionally randomly. Doctors have access to a lot of private information. And by and large, they use that private information effectively to identify people that need follow-up testing. And so if you train your algorithm only on the tested people, you're getting a set of unobservably sicker patients or unobservably different patients because that's who gets tested. Similarly, you know, if you, if you think about like how doctors allocate treatments, also not random, not conditionally random. That's why we have doctors. And if you get a bunch of people who are treated with antibiotics, you never know if they would have had an infection or not because it's censored. So these problems are huge and real. And I'll just kind of put a pointer to this paper uh, that Sundal Monathan and I wrote on testing for heart attack in the ED, where basically like the two solutions we develop are in the untested people, you can actually find some proxies 
for the, the thing that you want. It's not going to be the test result, but it's going to be things that are related to that latent medical problem that you don't measure, but that manifests itself in other ways. You can also use quasi-random variation in the allocation of the treatment decision, which is all too common in medicine, um, to, to get at whether the predictions are correct, and even to estimate the effect of providing predictions heterogeneously um, on, on whether that decision is effective or not. Okay, but to go back to what, what happens in this paper, in this paper, like in light of all of these problems in, in you know, not just like the, the selection problem, but just getting the data is a huge pain in the butt um, because now you don't just need one set of images. Now you need to link to the longitudinal data and get other sets of images and develop other labels. It, it's a huge lift. And so basically what happens here, as in many other papers, as Nicola, you pointed out, is that the, the ground truth is proxied by the agreement or the majority vote of experts. And so you can see that, that like this is the this is a little bit like the part of those horror movies where it's like the call is coming from inside the house and it's like it's all humans. It, even the AI is basically like it's all humans. Like our metric of quality is humans, our AI is humans. It's just different forms of, of human judgment that we're comparing to each other. Um, and I think this is like a, a really hard part of doing work in this area because ultimately like the only thing that you can reliably get for all cases is human judgment. But we also know that humans are not always right in a lot of ways. So I think what I, in my head, when I was reading this paper originally, what I, where my mind went was, what if you reframe the results, not around like who's right and who's wrong and who's making errors and who's not, but around just when do humans disagree and what does that mean? So if you do that, and, and Nick, I'm very curious to get your, your take on this, but doctors are presented with a prediction on what other doctors think about this image. And one thing I actually just would like to know whether you address this explicitly or not is, did the doctors know that this AI was predicting what humans would say? And, and, and I know, I, I'm sure you told them, but I think there's also this, this abstraction level where it's like, oh, it's AI. And that is a, I think it's an interesting way to also think about how they're updating and what they're updating. Um, it, it's like, if this is like black box as an AI prediction versus like, oh, this is a prediction on what other people at Stanford think about this X-ray, you might update quite differently. So reframing one of the most interesting results on cases where there is no disagreement, in other words, the AI is certain, doctors move towards the consensus judgment. Whereas on cases where there is disagreement as proxied by the AI being uncertain, doctors actually move away from the consensus. And I think what you think about that depends on whether you think that agreeing with the majority of doctors is good or bad, or whether that disagreement is an error or not. And I think that's a complicated question. Um, and the, one of the reasons it's complicated is because this happens all the time. Doctors disagree a lot. And so, you know, there's this uh, many studies, so I'm just highlighting a few here. So there's the second opinion study where uh, a doctor refers you to another doctor for problem A. And then after that second visit, your final diagnosis is B. And the probability that A equals B is like very low. And there's, there's quite a bit of like significant disagreement here. There's also these old studies from the tuberculosis literature in like the 40s and 50s where um, they got a, a handful of radiologists. They showed them x-rays of people with and without tuberculosis and they just got the agreement. And that's 0.75, like your likelihood of agreeing with another radiologist about whether there's tuberculosis or not. But then they passed the same x-ray. So they, they were just handing physical x-rays. So they, they just did a circle and they passed the same x-ray to the same radiologist on the same day and collected the disagreement with themselves. And that was like, you know, slightly better than disagreement with others. But this, this is one fact that I think Nikhil is reassuring for your within radiologist design. It's like, yeah, they're not remembering. Um, and, and they're actually probably disagreeing with themselves quite a bit. And this isn't just like a, a detail here. This is like for, for like, does this person have invasive breast cancer? There's a, you know, a high agreement rate of 0.96, but that means that there's a disagreement rate of 0.04. And I think when you're talking about whether you're going to get chemotherapy or a mastectomy, that's a pretty high disagreement rate. 
And it's useful to think about, you know, just put yourself in the position of like, oh, if this biopsy, like 4% of radiologists would say I have cancer, but 96% say I don't have cancer. I don't know how I think about that, but I probably wouldn't be like, yeah, let's just go with the majority vote. Um, so, so I think, but by the way, <laughs> this is also a problem on, on MTurk. I don't know if you saw, like the image net label for this image is a nipple generate some disagreement, uh, which is good. Um, so I think there are a couple of, you know, what you think about this depends a lot on what you think about why doctors disagree. Like what's the underlying model of the world that leads to disagreement? And I think there's like some, you know, like very standard explanations you could come up with um, from sort of traditional economic models and from newer behavioral models. And I think averaging can help sometimes but averaging might not help other times, depending on you know like what what's going on and what the underlying model is in this world. But let me also propose another reason for doctors to disagree, and I think I'm going to tell you about one study from the medical literature that addresses pneumonia on chest X-rays, which is one of the most important kind of labels and and things that radiologists look for on chest X-rays. It's a fantastic study that basically enrolled people who had an X-ray, were diagnosed with pneumonia, were treated with antibiotics, got put into the hospital. And this is like the bread and butter of medicine. This is like med school year one, pneumonia, antibiotics. So what they did is before any antibiotics were given, they did all the tests they could think of on these people. Like every, like no expense was spared. And they got to the bottom of what was causing pneumonia in 38% of cases. So the majority of the time, when we call something the money, we have no idea what's going on or what to do about it. And this is not just a problem about pneumonia. Like medicine is full of basically lots of times when we have no idea what's going on. And anyone who's been to a doctor with anything that's not like a broken bone has experienced this themselves. There's a ton of uncertainty. There's a ton of uncertainty all the time. And that's another thing that can generate disagreement. And I think that's interesting because I think my last comment is I wouldn't try to call disagreement something that it isn't. I would just really lean into the fact that disagreement is super interesting and that it can indicate these cases where there's just high uncertainty because of the nature of the case and the medical just unknowns in the case. And that's a great reason for doctors to disagree. And it's also very different from like the truth. Because whether something is an easy or a hard case, like it, it's orthogonal to whether the Y is zero or one. And so I wouldn't conflate those two things. Um, and rather, I think I would use disagreement as, a, you know, very much as you, I think you're, you're already doing as a metric for like, where is that right interface for the human and the machine to work together? Cases with high disagreement could be great cases where like you want to reallocate more human effort to collecting more data to thinking, to like asking a colleague, to doing lots of other things that humans can do and AI can't do. And that's a nice way to think about your optimal delegation problem as well. And I'll just point to this paper um, that, that uh, I collaborated on um, where we, we try to do something like that, where, where we look at the hard versus the easy cases and the, and the return to reallocating effort to the hard cases away from the easy cases. So let me stop there. Um, thanks so much. This is a, a great paper. I really enjoyed reading it and thinking about it. Okay, well, thank you so much, Ziad. Uh, we now have some uh, time for questions from the audience, but uh, before we go there, I want to give a chance to Nick Hill to respond if uh, he has any thoughts. Yeah, uh, I completely agree with Ziad that you know this uh, diagnostic standard is a difficult thing to get, and uh, there is a disagreement, and there's a you know a, a different interpretation also of our results if you take take it that way. I, I do want to point out a couple of things on this, so. Uh, while I agree that uh, you know this is not about whether the case actually had pneumonia or not, one way to interpret this, so first of all, the Mount Sinai guys are chest radiologist specialists, and they have at least 10 years of experience, right? So uh, they are doing much better than the typical radiologist that is reading the cases for the label data in Chexport. So that's one sort of qualitative thing to keep in mind. Uh, and the second thing is that you know we we have analyzed robustness of our results to cases where the Mount Sinai guys don't disagree, 
versus when they do. So like, can you can you rule out uh, statistically significantly rule out like an average probability of a 0.5 for the Mount Sinai guys, and the results are identical to that in that case. I completely agree that there's some inf there's you know hard cases versus easier cases, uh, and there's correlation in the AI and the humans between hard and easy cases. But I do think that uh, nonetheless, like you know, the treatment effects should always be positive if they're doing it right. So, but but I I, I you know I'll have to think a lot more about rephrasing things in terms of disagreement here. Uh, and I'm I'm looking forward to thinking more about that and how that changes uh, things. Yeah, we did think about it a bit, uh, for sure. But I really appreciate you know, taking the time uh, on that, you know, very thoughtful uh, discussion. Appreciate it. Okay, thanks. Uh, so just a reminder, if you have any questions, please do post them in Q&A. Um, currently, we have two questions. Uh, I'll call on you. So uh, if you want to ask the question yourself, please feel free to. If not, I can just read out the question. The first question is coming from Bob uh, Entrican. So Bob, uh, I'll unmute you in case you want to ask uh, the question. Uh, you can hear me okay now, I guess? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, one, I also appreciated the comments and the layout of the table. It explains very clearly and succinctly the the process that's going on in the decision making. And uh, it was not clear that there, in the beginning that there's no ground truth, uh, that in fact, it seems that this function M is uh, a function of multiple opinions that could disagree. And then the question I had is, uh, in the analysis and the computations that are being done, is there an, an assumption that all of the humans involved behave the same or on average, as one was saying, or are some of them better at this task than others? Yeah, so for the average treatment effect, it doesn't matter whether there's heterogeneity whatsoever, because you know, you're just averaging across the different radiologists. Uh, on the uh, model that I showed you, there's results in the paper that uh, allow for radiologic heterogeneity in there, and there's a whole distribution of the uh, parameters of the model. Uh, and then finally, we have another uh, study that's in the works, and you know, it's going to get it's it's in a gated it's a gated study because it's uh, going to come out in a medical journal uh, that unpacks whether the heterogeneity in uh, radiologist's response to AI is predictable? Uh, the answer is no. It's very difficult to predict it based on a number of things that we've uh, gotten in line surveys, including whether they have prior experience with AI or you know how well they do on baseline, etc. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for that part. Uh, but the short version is no. We don't assume that everybody is uh, homogenous in either scale or the process in which they uh, uh, use AI information or history. Okay, thank you. Um, so the second question is from uh, Bhaskar uh, Goswami. Um, Bhaskar, I'll unmute you uh, in case you would like to ask the question yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I was uh, thinking uh, if the adoption of AI, it was floated out in during the uh, webinar that uh, Radiologists would not be using these AI algorithms, but like, can a explainable AI such as uh, like if we if the radiologists are uh, aware of the pixels uh, or the parts of the X-rays that are more informative for the AI prediction, uh, be helpful and also con uh, like confirm in which they direction they were thinking and as well as which the yeah. AI is thinking. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating question. It's it's a challenging question. Because uh, what ideally you'd want to do is to explain the AI without providing new information or new signals. Uh, the simple way in which you said where certain pixels are highlighted or not is providing additional information on top of the signals. And since that, like you know, where it is highlighted, et cetera, conveys additional information, it's uh, a little bit more challenging to um, understand whether automation neglect or bias or other kinds of biases are at play. So it's it's a bit difficult. Uh, now, uh, there was a recent, there's a recent, you know, AI tool called Analyse.ai that 
presents its, you know, for chest x-rays, a very similar type of interface for AI predictions. They do highlight some regions that are suspicious as well. Uh, but, you know, you could, you can run the study of whether AI on average makes things better off or not, uh, when pixels are highlighted or not. But doing this as a function of signals or unpacking the behavioral biases is much more challenging in that case. I just also want to point out one thing, but that obviously economists will know very well, but that what those interpretability algorithms are largely doing is saying like, okay, if I randomly replace some pixels, um, what's the effect on the prediction? And so if that changes the prediction, then it's an important pixel. And if it, does. but it, there's a lot of correlations across pixels like that, you know, images are all about like they're there. There's, you know, you have two lungs, like, like there's two, there's two of lots of things in these images. And so if you, if like it's one pixel that's correlated with another pixel, which one is like the important. So these things are not straightforward and they're not clean and they're not reliable in any sense of the word as, as ways of understanding or explaining the, the predictions that they're just, they have all the problems that like correlating X and Y usually have. Okay, thanks. Uh, so there is one more question from uh, Robert. Um, Robert, please go ahead and ask if you'd like to ask it yourself. Sure. Um, what you've tested is asking the doctor to combine his knowledge with that of the AI, but people aren't very good at that. And it's quite easy to do better. AIs can do better. How much would the AI have been able to improve its prediction conditional on the radiologist's opinion? So, so that uh, question is essentially equivalent to asking how much better is the Bayesian benchmark? Uh, if I was able to elicit the doctor's opinion without any biases, uh, then that Bayesian benchmark tells you uh, what the answer is. And so I showed you some graphs uh, uh, from those results, but you can uh, dig deeper in the paper. Uh, one thing that I do would worry about if, if in the real world, if the doctors were asked to provide their opinion and something else was modifying it, uh, they might behave strategically, they might exaggerate, they might worry about malpractice and other things like that. And so uh, different kinds of elicitation issues show up uh, in that type of collaboration. Uh, and so we didn't uh, pursue that uh, in an experiment. Although you can think of uh, that as a benchmark, nonetheless, and for, for, for the straightforward answer to your question. Thank you. Uh, Maria, uh, you had a question. Would you like to ask? Uh, yes. OK, so I have a million questions, but I'll ask one only. So uh, you're uh, focusing, Nikhil, on like false negative versus false positive, on false negative rates, which are numbers. But I mean, from my personal experience with like med with extreme medicine, um, not the cost of all of these cases are not the same. It goes a little bit toward what the other is going of hard versus simple. Uh, and for instance, yeah. for cancer, my dad had cancer. They didn't m realize it in Iran for three years. Here, the doctors realized in a month. Okay. So it is a question of whether, so I think it's an important question of understanding whether the cases that the doctors adjust or do not adjust are in the cases that are more costly. I don't know how you can measure it, but it would, I think that would be a very, very informative thing. Yeah. I don't totally. know what you have thoughts on it. Yeah. Or not. Yeah. So uh, the results that use probabilities are immune to that as you, as you probably know. Uh, you know, so we do have cost of false positive, false negatives by pathology, and we have some characteristics of the people, so we can make them as a function of those observed characteristics. We have only 324 cases uh, that are read multiple times, so there's only so much we can do. Uh, then, but the only thing that we can estimate from that is the relative cost of false positive and false negatives. So if it was the case that, you know, some cases are much more important to get right than others, then that's uh, not so easy to do because uh, we don't have cross case comparisons because we, we don't say, okay, a radiologist says, okay, should I be spending, you know, should I be get, working to get this case right versus another case right? So that's not easy to do. But differential relative cost based on observed patient characteristics uh, are doable in principle uh, with the limitation that with the no limited number of cases that you, can, you can't you can get too much uh, granularity on that. Uh, 
but we also in the paper we have broken up all the results by uh, false positives versus false okay. negatives. It does not talk about heterogeneity across cases, though. But so even forgetting about the let's focus on false negative cases only. I'm wondering whether the ones that the people do worse with the yeah. AI versus the ones which are do they do better? Yeah. Is it different within the cost? So forget about the false positive at all. Within the cost categories, basically AI can help very much if the case is easy, or it can help very much if the case is hard. And that is an important yeah, yeah. thing. So, so uh, what we can do is as a function of the characteristics of the yes, yes. patient, we can do that. But, but because we don't have comparisons of like radiologists making decisions that should I focus more on this case versus this other case, that's hard to do. The other thing we can do for easy versus hard is whether this case usually takes longer or less, longer or less time for a radiologist and have heterogeneity and treatment effects as a function of that. So that that's something we can do and you know we should just do that. Thanks. Okay, so uh, we've run out of time for the main part. So please stay for the second part if you wanna ask uh, uh, questions uh, without being recorded, or just informal discussion. But uh, at this point, I would like to uh, thank everyone, the speakers in particular and everyone who participated. Um, our next webinar will be on February 29th. Uh, we don't, I don't believe we uh, have a speaker at this point, but uh, please check our website for more information on that. Thank you. Thank you.